We're back live in our Palo Alto studio, the IBM Storage Summit. The panel is here, the analyst panel is next. Sarbjeet Johal, friend of theCUBE. Great to see you again, and Rob Streche, a CUBE analyst. So uh, guys, let's unpack what we heard today. Uh, but I want to start with the industry. You know, Rob, I, we've been in the storage industry for a long time. Obviously it's evolved into the, the data business, right? With data is much more interesting than what my wife used to call snorage. But, <laughs> but storage is not boring anymore because it is so much tied to data and AI. But Sarbjeet, uh, you've been an observer as well. You've worked for a lot of different companies, both on the buy side and the sell side. How have you seen the evolution of, you know, what used to be generally known as storage, storage box industry to where we are today? Yeah, storage has evolved a lot. Actually, I used to work at EMC, the storage company. Yep. <laughs> is, you know. I've heard of that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you heard of it. Um, yeah, the storage has, has evolved uh, all along, but since the virtualization, storage uh, needed to evolve even faster. And, and it's always a dance of like between compute, storage, and networks. Like you know, sometimes the one one sort of one of these three sort of uh, players runs ahead. Is it's it's that delicate dance of these three three entities, if you will, in computing. Um, storage is becoming smarter over the time, and we have storage policies now, like what data needs to move where, how fast we need to get back back to that data, and, and do we need it real time access, do we need to cache some stuff? So it, it's all over the place, but with the advent of AI, we, which we'll talk about a little bit in, in, in a few minutes, um, I think the intelligence needs to come more to the storage layer to provide security as well as performance. I think those are the two, two key factors. And economics matter all matters all along. And actually, I'm an economics major. We always talk about the consumption economics. And personas matter. Economics or the practitioners matter, like how much training they need, what they can, what is in it for them to change, if you will. Um, Developers, architects, they, they all play a role in this. But storage is one of those constructs in computing which is a little abstracted from the developers, to be honest with you. Like a developer actually thinks last thing about the storage, right? Um, they still think about the network traffic, bandwidth, and all that. But from the security point of view, I think storage is key. Um, our RTO, RPOs depend upon like how quickly we can get back to data and how and not lose analyze it. and not yeah. lose it, yeah. How, how, about, how about you, Rob? Yeah. I mean, you know, storage has become you know, programmable. I mean, that's a, obviously a big change. What, what else have you seen? Yeah, I, I think that they're moving up into data platforms. And I think what we've been talking about is really how there's always the accessibility versus the security aspect of it where there's challenges and trade-offs that need to be made. And I think that a big piece of it is going to be that as it evolves and as protocols become less of a, a, a thing and it's more about access methodologies such as REST or going through and using file or POSIX, NFS, what have you to get at the data, I think that transparency of that, meaning that it, the systems can do everything now and they're not just one specific system you go by here, I'm going to go buy this for file, I'm going to buy this for object, I'm going to buy this for block. The coming together of that has really, I, I think we're at that point where they are together. And that's really a key. I, I think the platform angle as well, I mean, you know, we love them and hate them, the Gartner Magic Quadrants, but you've seen how the, how the storage Magic Quadrants evolved. I'm not that up to speed on it, but I mean, the last time I looked at it, it was like every company was up and to the right, you know, because and my point of all that is that the industry has just really morphed into a data platform, and that means different things to different people. It could mean data management, right? It could mean, you know, the data science piece of it. It could mean, you know, managing storage, but they're all sort of coming together in a vent. Yeah, I think the, the technology is one part of it. I think people and processes matter a lot, you know, which we, most of the vendors tend to talk less about. They always talk about products, you know? <laughs> this is our product. You know, so <laughs> people in products, well, well the, the services companies do, right? I, I like, the I like, consultancies do. I like Pete's session today a lot because, because you guys also touch upon the personas, you know, like yeah. who, who are different personas you find yourself right. to appeal to. Um, I think um, it matters a lot. Like, like, how do we change the consumption patterns 
what are the new protocols, what are the new needs, like streaming was not like that much needed earlier on, but now that's the thing, right? So what does that do to the data access and caching? And um, I think the performance matters a lot, and performance means different things to, to different people. Uh, it means different thing to developer, then architect, then a platform engineer. Performance means different thing, and of course the CFO looks at the performance in numbers, right? And the, how um, economically viable these systems are. So I think speed is the new scale. We say we heard that term, that phrase many times. I think that matters in storage um, sort of scenario a lot, and speed also is of different types, the speed to deploy systems, the speed to detect um, attack, speed to respond to the attack, right? And also the performance of the system itself is a speed construct, if you will. So I think getting to performance systems on, from all fronts, including economic performance, if you will, um, it is a trick. Quite a few things have to converge to, to get there, and, and it's the t technology, processes, people, storytelling, um, partnerships and alliances, uh, openness of your system. Uh, we, were t we, we, we heard about the ecosystem earlier and an open data standard. I think Vincent was talking about that. Uh, I, I think that's a, that's a great development, and a few other vendors are hopping onto that too. Um, Let's talk about AI a little bit. So. You know, we know from some of the ETR survey data that people are going to buy it embedded or they're maybe going to buy it direct. My question to you guys is, let's, let's talk about IBM and, and others in the storage business. How should they be leveraging AI? Obviously they can do it for, you know, AI ops within the system and automation in the system. But I feel like Rob, there's more than, than that in terms of an, an opportunity for the, yeah. the storage industry. I, I think, and, and you know, building off Sarjeev's comments on that, I think there's the aspect of locality, data locality. Where does the data live and how do you get at that data, especially when you're talking about AI and you're building models and, and I think there's going to be much more specific models or small language models versus these ultra large ones that are billions and billions of uh, different kind of parameters, I think you're going to start to see that same thing is going to get applied to the actual systems themselves. How do you bring the actual compute to the data and the data to the compute? There's going to be some of that motion. And I think some of that was hit on as well during the different sessions we had today is how do you have kind of that transparency of data both on-prem and in the cloud? But when you, you know, the, the standard line these days is I'm going to bring the AI to the data. So what does that actually mean? And you just said bring the compute to the data and then bring the other way around, if you, you know, Einstein move, a variation of Einstein, move, <laughs> move as much data as you need to, but no more, yeah. right? But so, but, but what does that mean to the data platform? I mean, the data's sitting in storage. So if I'm going to bring the AI to the data, it's in databases too, of course, but the databases are sitting on storage. So. What should the storage vendors be doing to take advantage of that? Is it just making sure it's resilient, get it to get it there fast? I mean, that that's that plumbing piece of it is critical. Are there other things that customers should be thinking about that they should be asking their vendors to do? I think number one is security. Number two is performance. Uh, performance from all different aspects, which we just talked about: yep. economic performance, system performance, and 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 the 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 productivity of the practitioners who are operating these systems, that, that is part of that whole thing, right? So I, I think the use of AI, it, it, we have to talk in three different buckets. One is very short term, like what we can do in the next six to 12 months. And then what we can do in from one to two or th one to three years. Mm -hmm. And then what we will do in long term. We, we have to strive for that long term as um, as a few IBM fellows, um, fellows were talking, Andy was talking about that. I, I think he explained it really well, like where we are headed. So, as we okay, ideally, like let's talk about the ideal situation. Ideally, we should get the pack packets coming to us, which will which needs to be stored, right? And 
we can analyze those for their authenticity, where who who's, who's sending them, is it good data, should we persist it, or is it attack coming in our way, right? So that kind of mechanism, we need that. And right now, Andy was talking, they're doing sampling of the packets and take a look at the compressibility of, um, of the data, how much they can compress, so that's one measure. The other measure is how the data is looking from the pattern of the data, is, is, is any anomaly in it. But there'll be more things like that. The, the, there was an example in the very early session, I just, which, which I really loved, that how many times you, you pay attention to the car alarm. But, yeah. but, but you, if the car alarm is at home, then you pay less attention because you know your surroundings and you live in a decent area, hope, hopefully, right? Or if the car alarm is happening in Tenderloin in San Francisco, you run to your car because you know that something is wrong. So the context injection on the fly is very important. And for that, you need a lot more compute. We need compute to help storage. And then we talked about that today, that in the controllers, some of the compute is being utilized from the controller to, to put the intelligence into the, the storage layer. And, and I think this, the compute is the key. Com storage needs compute to be intelligent. Very interesting, because cloud, I've said a number, number of times, cloud is code, code is now natural language. Right. That requires compute. Yeah, and I, and I think to, to both your points, I think bringing it to the flash modules, which they're talking about, and to the individual, and having it be this large distributed system, because data is distributed. I, I, th I think that's, er, there, there's no company where all their data is in one platform or in one place. I think some companies would love that to be the case <laughs> to make the money off it, but I think what you need to look at is how can you look at and approach all of the data to bring it to where you need it. And I think it goes back to what you were saying around iceberg tables and going and looking at data formats and how you bring that kind of transparency and openness to it. And I think that's, that's going to be a huge key for them is how do you really get to that next level of data usability with the security, with the performance, so that it's the right place transformed the right way. Yeah, I think the, the, the standards and openness brings, brings the, we need to bring the new, sort of, we need to neutralize it to different uh, protocols for access, different types of storage. This is, there are tons. Uh, the one session, in one of the sessions, uh, where uh, I think Winston was ta talking about, we, we are applying virtualization to the storage layer. Yeah. And once you apply the virtualization, you can do a lot with it. So you can neutralize the, the formats and the, the economics of the data, which is very close to storage, will come from that layer, I think, from the from by virtualizing it. By virtualizing, you can change, change the formats and you can slice and dice the data, you can compress it, you can say, oh, oh this is only incremental data, like we, we need to only send this data further down where it needs to be sent or we need to store this data here versus their tape versus you know higher performance storage and so forth. So I think virtualization in, in the storage layer, uh, it will progress. Again, coming back to the time horizon, in the very long term, I think we will apply a lot more, more compute uh, to the storage layer, just like TPU we use today for security reasons and for network performance. We, we have offloaded the CPU into different sort of cards, if you will. I think we will do the same thing with storage. Oh yeah, there's there's you know historically a lot of, a lot of waste in terms of yeah. managing storage with you know traditional whatever x86 systems or spend a lot of time do, not doing you know doing things that they that you could have a specialized you know processor do. But your point about virtualization, data virtualization, I think there's widespread acceptance now that data is distributed, you can't just, you know, it's the Jamak Dagani, you got to rethink your data architecture. You're not just going to shove it into one centralized container with one centralized group that manages it. Yes, they can manage that virtually. Even, you take even a snowflake, which is say, put everything into our system, but they recognize that there's, it's a single global instance that spans regions across the cloud. Certainly Databricks is doing right. the same thing. IBM is sort of, I mean, go back to mainframe global Sysplex, has always had that sort of philosophy of having you know, uh, strictly consistent capabilities, but at remote distances. Um, so that's happening. Uh, and now you, know, you bring 
we haven't talked really much about edge today, but people talk about AI inferencing at the edge. They talk about real time and, and that is a whole lot of data. Now, whether or not that data gets persisted, yeah. you will see. But I, uh, I, I thought I, that's, I think, a really interesting thing that it wasn't talked about, but they're more or less doing it if you think about how they're using AI in the flash modules to be right. able to do this intelligence and that is actually those models are being trained in the cloud and pushed down in new firmware. Yeah. So technically, it depends on what you consider edge also, the, you can bring it that way and how, and it's not, I don't think it's such a huge leap to say this is the direction they're going in, this is how we're going to build these systems to be more agile and more edge aware or edge-like in that. Yeah, another, uh, great points there. I, I think another thing is that it, it's maybe in, in the storage company's interest to sell more boxes to us, right? But I, I think that shouldn't be the case. They, they should sell us more smarter storage, but maybe smaller boxes, but smarter, which where we sort of don't store most most of the data, but some data, whatever data we need to, to be sold, compression is a huge you know, concept in, in storage, like how much you can compress and where we are storing it, that, that also matters, like tape is, we, you talked about earlier, tape is still relevant, right? So I, I think bringing, again, coming back to the intelligence and storage, we, we, st we st still have a long way to go to bring intelligence into storage because we are storing a lot more data. We are storing exhaust, we're storing logs, like we, we just, okay, by the way, one very important part, like you must have heard, like seen that interview from the um, open AI's um, chief scientist talking to um, uh, Jensen. Jensen, yeah. Jensen yeah, yeah. of uh, Ilya, NVIDIA. Ilya. NVIDIA. Ilya. Ilya from. Yeah, open, Ilya from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great interview if you haven't seen. A great interview, yeah. If you haven't watched uh, viewers, you should watch that. Um, so one of the key concepts behind generative AI is compression. It compresses the date, hell out of the data. So um, one of the the models, which is not from from Nvidia, um, I forgot the name of that, but it, it's just it apply. It applies to the pictures. Like you can you can paint the picture when you say okay, okay, just draw you know this picture for me, or, or, or it will be used for movies. That whole data is compressed the, the to two gigabyte file, two gigabyte. So world's knowledge about all the uh, user interface or all the video you know rendering is compressed into two gigabyte. Can you imagine that? It's crazy, you can run that on your cell phone. So the compression is important. So from that compressed data, because after training, the models are very small, right, in size. So we are using that for inference. We will use that at the edge, right? So that means we need less storage for more intelligence. There's something we need to think through a little more when we talk about storage and New York. So I know we're tight on time. Ken, I, I wonder if we can extend this session a little bit longer, because I want to unpack some of the things that, that Sarbjeet said, and maybe we'll just, we'll just go, go into the wrap from here if we can. Um, you know, you talked about, first of all, you talked about smaller boxes. I mean, I think people want to consume, like in the cloud model, in the consumption yeah. model, right? I mean, that's, I think, I think pretty clear. And, Pretty much everybody will allow you to do that. The other thing that Ilya talked about in that interview was scale. That until they realized the importance of scale, it was like a breakthrough. And we were talking about you yeah. know scale and and GPFS today. Right. Um, and 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 then that allowed them to. How did he say it, Sarbji? He said basically to understand the human condition, right? And that's why. That's why it hallucinates because it's got all this data in there, right? And what, so what, what he was saying was that, like, the question was why we were always failing in this AI. Like all of a sudden, what happened? All of a sudden, we succeeded big time. Where was the magic? It was the amount of data thrown at that. We were doing smaller experimentations in academia, and academia doesn't have much data, right? So they then. The likes of Jensen, because they want to sell chips, right? They said, okay, let me help you. We have billions of dollars. <laughs> like, let me give you yeah. tons of data. And he, par he partnered with the U University of Toronto scientists, or data scientists, and 
here you go. Like, it's a big bang, you know, in computing. Now, the other thing I want to pick up on is you and I were, on, were having a little Twitter. I don't think it was threads. I think, yeah, we were on Twitter. And we were talking about moats. Yeah. Um, and I was saying, well, the moats are going to be the quality of the data, the propriety of the data, and then all the other things that matter, go to market, brand, reputation, execution, dot, dot, dot. And then Crawford chimed in, Crawford Del Pret, the CEO of IDC, I thought he had an interesting comment, which is like, it's also the currency of the data. And this is big, David Floyer's big thing. It's like data value declines significantly over time. Now, I'm not saying you don't want to go back and, and reach back and, and look at history, you do. But the real time nature, the, the more current the data is, generally speaking, you know, it's a power law, the more valuable it is. Right, and I, I think that's why some things will be done in certain places and the models will be continually trained, right? And that are going to be continually refreshed because they become out of date and they're even seeing that with ChatGPT now where it's declining in accuracy and speed in certain aspects of what it tries to calculate as they make them smaller and more compartmentalized. I think that's- Entropy, it's like Andy Walls was saying. It is, and I, I, winning. I think that when you start to look at all of these how people are going to use AI and how companies and storage companies build it in, they need to be able to understand that. And this is, I, I think the storage companies in particular have been doing this because if you look at it, they had to look, understand how, how often a drive was going to fail. And they wanted to know that that drive was going to fail and they would ship you one before it failed because they knew the parameters that they were looking for. Back then it was called analytics and things of that nature. Now it would be called modeling and AI and all of that fun. But I think that's the key is that the data where it lives, how it's applied and how it's refreshed is, is going to continually put stress on the storage that companies have. Yeah, we, during the SuperCloud 3 session, which we had like, we talked about the specialized model for different verticals, but also horizontal models for all verticals. For example, like security, some part of the security yep. for companies is very horizontal. Right. You know, like, you know, DDoS attack is horizontal, like anybody can get it, right? So we need to, we need a solution for that, for example, right? But some part- Identity. Identity is yeah. horizontal. Yeah. And, but some parts of the security are very uh, vertical specific as well. So we, I, I believe in the long term, we will have the models which are horizontal by the capability in, in IT stack, if you will, in security um, scenario and the story scenario as well. But some will be very specific to pharma, uh, health, healthcare, pharma, auto. So they will be very specific to that. So we'll have a- Data, 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 yeah. data, and all, model. all and, specific to those and, industries. And the models will like stick to it, like mm -hmm. mRNA yeah, vaccine like that works. sticking to us right now. Yeah, it's sticking to our, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the protein. So it will be like a mRNA, mRNA uh, kind of a mechanism where we stick the, the um, AI to, the, to our moving um, blood flow, which is data. <laughs> so it's been a good day. Um, again, we love this format uh, live in our Palo Alto studio. We inject you know, pre-records. We have one more uh, pre-record. Uh, I interviewed Chris Maestas. He had this concept of this information supply chain, which of course you've heard that before, but how a global data platform turns storage for AI into an information supply chain. That's a really good session that we had there. And Sarbji, appreciate you sort of watching today. Uh, I know you're going to be you know, socializing it in your massive network like you, you do, Rob, Rob Streche, my, our co-host. And of course, I want to thank you know, IBM who made this, this possible, brought in its ecosystem, its, its experts, and we're going to continue this conversation. Of course, all this data is available as replays on demand at thecube.net. Uh, it's, on, it's on YouTube as well. So we want to thank you, you know, reach out, check out siliconangle.com. That's where all the news is going to be. And, uh, and hit us up on social, uh, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, sometimes Facebook, sometimes <laughs> threads, <laughs> Instagram, we're out there. You know where to find X us. X now, X. X, yes. X now, yes. right, X. <laughs> That's right, he paid nothing for the logo, I understand, but, uh, yeah. but is willing to pay somebody who has the X uh, uh, handle. Handle, there, right? Yeah. Yep, somebody just took it.
Thank, All right. Thanks. Well, great yeah. to see you yes. in person. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> great to have you. Uh, thanks again for watching, everybody. Uh, keep it right there for the next segment on uh, AI uh, into an information supply chain. Thanks for watching.